Um, all right, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. And um, so I took this opportunity uh, to give a, a talk on interfacial multiphase environmental chemistry. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But I really see this symposium in honor of uh, Jim Anderson, a, a brilliant scientist who's done a lot of great work in the area of uh, in atmospheric chemistry but also the Dreyfus Foundations and the programs it supports. And I think you said it very nicely, Barbara, you know, it really uh, is a foundation that has uh, been at the heart of the chemical sciences of supporting a number of people. And we do, I don't think we uh, appreciate the fo these foundations as much as we should. So I just wanted to uh, have a shout out for the Dreyfus Foundation, how it can change lives by funding different programs um, in really important ways. So I, I think it's important to, to note that. And so that's why I'm here. I'm here in celebration of, of both you, Jim, and, and the foundation and, and uh, all of that it has done. So um, interfacial multiphase chemistry. Um, so sort of taking a big picture view, by definition, it occurs at the intersections of the geosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere. So water, land, air. So that's where the, the whole idea of these two phases uh, affecting all these spheres, and of course you have the biosphere on top of all of them. Um, and then at the, at the interface between these is where all the exciting chemistry is going, and, and Barbara told us about you know, surface chemistry and the importance of surface chemistry, and so here we have that example. And so when you work in, in interfacial and multiphase chemistry, you have conversations like, you know, what is a rock? And uh, an answer to that is, and what I mean by a rock, it doesn't do anything, you know, a rock. He's my rock, she's my rock, you know, it's something that doesn't do anything. So what is a rock? A rock is something that doesn't uh, involve any water because once that happens, you put a rock in water, you have a lot of different chemistry going on. Um, you hear, you also think about things like, oh, these surfaces, they're so complex. And I, you know, Barbara, you said you're gonna embark on this uh, chemistry of understanding these interfaces and that's a lot of work. I think you're gonna be busy for like a, a number of years, decades, if you will, and, and the reason why is that when you think about the surface, it really was invented by the devil. <laughs> it's very complex, uh, whereas God made the bolt, something we can better understand. So uh, interfacial and multiphase chemistry impacts, I, and again, I'm taking a very broad view of things. It's, it impacts everything, uh, water quality, air quality, element cycling, ozone depletion, climate, soil contamination, even food production. And so this is something that really, you know, uh, is, is, is vast and, and affects everything. And it affects health. And I don't just mean human health, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute, minute but ecosystem health and, and even planet health. So, um, you know, when we think about atmospheric chemistry and even some of the, the big awards that we uh, uh, have, are, are recognizing, a lot of it is gas phase chemistry. Uh, so a lot of our understanding uh, from the past, when I was an undergraduate student, I talked to someone about sulfur chemistry. It was all gas phase chemistry that we, we talked about, sulfur oxidation chemistry, uh, all about the gas phase. We know the Nobel Prize uh, it was given for contributions to the perturbation of gas phase chemistry, ozone concentrations in the stratosphere. Uh, Jim, I read your award uh, uh, citation, if you will, you know, your pioneering measurements of free radicals. Uh, that drive the chemistry of the atmosphere, establishing the foundation for worldwide agreements to protect the stratospheric ozone layer. Excellent work, brilliant work. So uh, really great, great work. And so congratulations. Um, but I'm gonna talk about sort of, and, and Barbara mentioned this already, sort of aerosol chemistry, uh, the importance of the aerosols in their surfaces and how they have emerged over the last many years. And so the surface of atmospheric aerosols in the stratosphere has been pretty well studied. Um, they provide a unique medium, these polar stratospheric clouds, ice particles, um, and they, they do contribute, that reactions on those surfaces contribute to the ozone hole. And what was really interesting, when the Nobel Prize was given out in surface chemistry for Gerhard Ertl, I was listening to NPR at the time, and what they said was that he did chemistry related to the ozone hole, because um, of the reactions that can occur on ice surfaces. And I was sitting in the car and I said, no, he didn't. He didn't do that. Uh, what he did was he did very fundamental surface science as it relates to the uh, harbor process and nitrogen fixation and the formation of ammonia. So 
if I was writing this citation, I would say it was more related to food production than it was actually related to uh, stratospheric ozone hole depletion. And I think this has something to do with science communication. We sometimes try to make connections um, and then they go in different directions, if you will, with news outlets, but uh, I thought that was really uh, interesting. So I clearly explain what Ertl did and what Ertl didn't do in my little uh, diagram over, over there. And so, um, but you know, so, th so this whole idea of this multi-phase chemistry in the troposphere, and I would say that no one has won the Nobel Prize on that yet, not even Ertl, right? Okay. So what have we done in my group? Well, we've combined surface chemistry with atmospheric chemistry. I've done a little bit of work on the stratosphere as it relates to ice, but the, the, the most important word, I just said a little bit. Um, and more, more importantly, we have really focused on the troposphere. Um, and I would say that the Dreyfus Foundation played a key role in my er work in that area. You know, sometimes a number of things have to happen at the right time for someone to get into an area. And uh, getting that uh, money from the, for the postdoc to start that work was really a key in uh, my career. And so we've uh, kept on going and uh, since we got that funding in the 1990s and we have been going ever since uh, focusing on, on this important area. So I, I'm gonna talk about uh, atmospheric aerosols um, as my first uh, uh, topic and my only topic, but I just wanna talk about a few different things related to it for, for people who, who don't know much about it. Uh, and Barbara gave some really good uh, background in this regard. You know, we're talking about particulate matter, you know, we call it different things in the, in the atmosphere. They could be solid or liquid particles. Sometimes we don't know the phase and Barbara just talked about that. Um, they have diameters anywhere from two nanometers to 100 micrometers, so many length scales. And this large you know, difference in, in size has to do with different formation mechanisms. And Barbara talked very specifically about uh, gas to particle conversion and the formation of aerosols from that chemistry. Um, and some of the larger particles are for you know, direct emissions of primary aerosols into the atmosphere as well. Um, so, you know, if you look around you, they're everywhere, you know, even that little smoke in that Earl and Meyer flask, right, that you were showing. And so these are, you know, these are how we think about these on that the scale. So we can take these uh, types of microscopy images. What's really fascinating about atmospheric aerosols, you know, is the fact that they affect everything from climate to human health, okay? And so, you know, uh, what else is there to study in some ways, okay? And so climate impacts, you know, you have uh, the, uh, the formation of clouds uh, seeded by um, uh, these aerosols in the atmosphere or they reflect sunlight back into space, all affecting climate. From health impacts, um, we know uh, for many years pulmonary, but cardio, and now the, the new science, if you will, is that it has an impact on brain health as well. And there's starting to be a number of studies uh, that show that. So either aerosols pass the blood-brain barrier, or there's some uh, cytokines that have formed, or, you know, there's different mechanisms, we really don't understand it. But uh, nonetheless, it's very important for us to think about. Um, in my own lab, we think about, you know, atmospheric aerosols from a chemistry perspective. And if you look at this beaker, what you can see is there's a lot of interesting chemistry going on. There's photochemistry, there's aqueous phase chemistry, if you look at the clouds. Um, there's uh, radical chemistry that uh, Jim has studied uh, so much uh, in his career. And so I'm gonna talk specifically about our work on mineral dust and, and sea spray aerosols um, as we have uh, developed that chemistry over the last uh, couple of decades. And so we just had the question of, you know, what happens when you form sea spray from uh, wave breaking from the oceans or um, you have dust storms that happen from, for example, here from Africa that make its way over to the U.S. or dust storms in China. You have trace atmospheric gases, NOx, SO2, ozone, hydroxyl radical, all these different reactive species and what happens. And so, you know, in order to do this, you need to develop the tools to study it. That's what Barbara talked a lot about, developing tools to study this uh, chemistry. 
And we were motivated by this paper now, um, and this is where the Dreyfus Foundation comes in again, and is that uh, we, uh, I was at Iowa at the time, University of Iowa, my colleague was Greg Carmichael, and he gave a wonderful physical chemistry talk on mineral dust aerosol and how it is a reactive component of the Earth's atmosphere, and he was a modeler, an atmospheric uh, chemistry modeler. And I was listening to that seminar, and I, I, all I can think about was, wow, that's a really messy system. You know, like, uh, I'm never going to study that. But I was, I guess, intrigued. And I went back, and I looked at this paper. And what I, what I learned from this paper was it was just a lot of guessing. I guess you call it guesstimates. <laughs> Estimates of things you really don't know how to uh, take into account. And I really thought there was a void, if you will, of information that was needed for them to really do these types of analyses. And so uh, we, we kind of went into that right af after this uh, paper came out. And what we wanted to do was, as, as, as Barbara said, we really wanted to do fundamental laboratory studies to help interpret field measurements, data for modeling analysis, and now I would even add predictive uh, analyses of the, of the atmosphere, however we can get there. Um, so we, we started, uh, I call it a chemist approach, uh, because mineral dust uh, for some of the atmospheric scientists was just one thing, one entity. As chemists, we know it was made of a lot of different things, clays, iron oxides, calcium carbonate, um, several, you know, many different types of minerals. So we, we approach this by studying some of the single components, as well as these complex mixtures where we can then analyze what exactly was in the different mixtures. What was really important in our studies, and I think we um, did this, this as well, is that, you know, water vapor, uh, there's a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, and I think it plays a big role in the chemistry of the atmosphere, and so we, were, we, were, we always had relative humidity that we defined uh, exactly in, in our experiments. And so we did a number of different types of experiments over the years. And we've been able to do a lot of different things. So once you start in a field, things just build up. And again, it was that you know part of this first uh, uh, heterogeneous chemistry of the components of mineral dust, where we looked at that reactions with a number of different important gases in the atmosphere. We showed that particle mineralogy really mattered. It mattered if it was calcium carbonate or quartz. And we showed the role of adsorbed water in that reaction chemistry um, on, over a range of different types of chemistries. We then went on to look at iron-containing dust. There was a lot of interest in the dissolution of iron and whether it got into the oceans and what, what, what could happen from there. We did a number of studies really looking at the amount of soluble iron, iron-2 and iron-3. We call it bioavailable iron, if you will. And then uh, we even did some chemistry, or I should say even uh, measurements of the optical as well as the climate relative, uh, relevant properties of mineral dust aerosol. So um, we have a number of different papers, and here's just some of the different uh, people that have been involved in this work over the years. As, as Barbara said, it's, it's not just me, it's, it's us. There's many people involved in that chemistry, and I just sort of give you uh, some uh, examples that are, are shown here. So, um, and and what, what's really interesting, and I'm not going to go into the detail of these chemistry, because there's 100 papers, you know, just on this slide, if you will, of the detail of how we went into some of these things, is that I, I think we had some success, you know, so I wanted to do these laboratory studies, and I wanted to, you know, have an impact on the uh, measurements being made in the field as related to these mineral dust aerosol. Uh, I wanted to be able to um, use this in, in models, and so here's just uh, uh, three examples of how we were able to um, advance the science, if you will, from our laboratory studies on mineral dust aerosol to uh, very different um, areas of field studies, of remote sensing even, so I never had that in my mind at all, and then it turns out that uh, these, uh, our data are being used to analyze uh, ozone concentrations in the atmosphere because you have to subtract out mineral dust in order to get that number right. So kind of interesting different directions that things tend to take. 
So um, what are we doing now? Um, so uh, we continue our work. Um, we're interested in this multi-phase chemistry of individual now. We're going to these mineral dust particles inside an aqueous aerosol or cloud or fog drop droplet. Um, we're using an, uh, an aerosol optical tweezer to study this type of chemistry so you can study on its own a single eight micron droplet and monitor that chemistry in, in real time. Um, we're interested in, you know, what is the role of organics in this chemistry? So it, it's, we have now sulfur chemistry going on. Sulfur oxidation chemistry has been studied for so long. You can go back to the 1980s and read some great papers by Mike Hoffman and other people. But, you know, we want to now push that uh, to another level by looking at what happens when you have organics present. You know, so a lot of studies have been on the inorganic part, but what, ha what happens when you have organic presence. So that's what I'll start off with, just trying to understand um, how when you have metals, you remember that dissolution of iron 2, iron 3, you have some organic compounds, so building up the complexity and how it uh, impacts or not sulfur oxidation chemistry. So, um, the, so, so this is the, the sulfur oxidation chemistry um, as it relates to being catalyzed by iron, extensively investigated for many years. It's complicated, right? It's radical-driven chemistry um, in, the, in the aqueous phase. I listed some references, and so um, this is the typical uh, mechanism that one writes. The kinetics can be very complex, first order under this regime, second order, 1.5 order under another regime, you know, 0.2 order on a different regime, and so it's, it's really quite complex. Um, and I just wanted to show you that it's, it's a radical-driven chemistry. And so when you have radical-driven chemistry, almost anything can happen in some ways, right, because these radicals are very reactive. So um, Lu Bin Huang, um, what he did was he wanted to look at what happens when you have uh, water-soluble organics. Um, so methyl vinyl ketone is sort of water-soluble, not that great, but methyl acrylene, and we've done some others. So these are two oxidation products of isoprene, a very uh, large gas phase compound uh, organic in the, in the atmosphere that plays a key role. Um, and what happens when you have uh, iron present, so in that uh, aqueous droplet, and he actually did this under bulk uh, aqueous conditions, and then I'll show you why we need to go to a droplet in more detail in a minute. And what he sh saw was that he had some very rich chemistry. So the inorganic was reacting with the organic, and we were making organo organosulfates and organosulfites. And so he was able to show that chemistry and wrote a number of papers while he was uh, here in my laboratory. And now he has his own position. He's in, he's, he moved back to China and has his own faculty position now. Um, he, we have a, you know, a, a mechanism, and the only thing I want to say about this mechanism, again, it's driven by that radical chemistry. So the iron is there, and it initiates the formation of these radicals, and then these radicals can act, react with the organics that are present. And this represents a new mechanism for organosulfur compounds in the, in the atmosphere. More recently, we've been uh, working with uh, uh, Shani um, uh, Hederachachi, and she now is starting to look at, well, can this chemistry occur on the surface of mineral dust particles? Again, what I showed you was we've looked at the inorganics, we looked at some organic acids, but what happens when all of these things are together when we increase that complexity? And what we see is that we start to form, in the case of when we have absorbed SO2, we can again form these organosulfur compounds. The way we do this chemistry is we let these gases react on these surfaces, and then we take these and we extract out the organics and we see what's there with mass spectrometry. So she's really showing there's a lot of rich chemistry occurring on mineral dust particles, sort of forming secondary or organic aerosols that then just don't, don't go back into the uh, gas phase. And I believe she had a poster uh, last night and uh, maybe presenting uh, again later in, the, in, in this week as well. Um, another thing that we did with the sulfur oxidation chemistry, we decided to measure some of the kinetics of that chemistry, and we wanted to look at the bulk versus aerosol phase. So one of the Dreyfus advisors, I think it is, uh, Dick Zare, has shown that uh, reactions in micro droplets occur much faster than bulk solutions. Uh, he measures things like 10 to the sixth enhancement in reactivity, and we wanted to see, does this happen for sulfur oxidation chemistry? Is this enhancement occurring? And Kyle Engel, who, who uh, worked on this, uh, 
uh, did these measurements. And so we, what we did in this case is we did use the aerosol optical tweezers to monitor the sulfate formation, so product formation. Um, we have a number of data that I show you here. We do a lot of calibrations. Um, Kyle is one of the best experimentalists I know, and the reason why I say that is, and he's here in the audience, I don't mean to embarrass you, Kyle, is that he's all about controls. We do a lot of controls because he, we more controls, we can say more bold things about what we're doing. So he always does these controls in, in a really great manner. And so he was able to um, analyze these data and looking at sulfate formation, and that's what, whoops. So we see the formation of sulfate in panel B as that sulfate grows in as he's undergoing. So we're looking at sulfite to sulfate chemistry in the presence of these transition metals. And we're gonna compare bulk uh, aqueous phase versus this micron droplet uh, phase if you will. And so what he's defined was an apparent acceleration factor, AAAF is basically the rate of sulfate formation in the aerosol versus the bulk. He, we do a lot of different experiments under a lot of different conditions, and what we can say is we start to see an order to almost two orders of magnitude difference in, in, in that uh, rate for the aerosol. And so um, what this suggests is that there's some effects due to the fact that you have that surface and these reactions are, are occurring at the surface and then diffusing back into the bulk. And if you read this paper that we wrote um, in Environmental Science and Technology, um, it, Kyle, what he does is he does a calculation. How many times does you, you sample the surface and can this in fact be an important uh, reaction pathway? And so uh, we, we propose that the acceleration is due to this interfacial reactivity. And we just got funding from the Air Force to actually continue some reactions in this regard, looking at micro droplet chemistry as we've done here, because we really want to see what kind of uh, mechanisms are involved and look at these surfaces in more detail. Okay, so um, I talked to you about our work on mineral dust um, and the brown uh, haze, if you will, in this picture of the flat earth is uh, mineral dust. But another thing that we have been uh, also working on in the last few years is uh, sea spray aerosol. And I just wanna tell you a little bit more about that work. And the picture here is just depicting our planet, our planet Earth. I don't know, uh, as it was last year, and it's probably gonna change next year, and we'll hear more about that when people focus on climate uh, in later talks. But the ocean is about 71% of the Earth's surface, and so it's a very important component of uh, our, our planet. And so we were interested in studying uh, sea spray, spray aerosol, and I'll tell you about, again, you know, the, you know, again, thinking about these spheres, you know, the hydrosphere and the atmosphere and how everything is uh, interacting. So uh, we wanted to understand the chemistry. So when you have wave breaking, you get sea spray. Everybody knows that, you know, just walk along the beach here in San Diego when you get a chance, you'll have a great time. Um, and, you know, what I would say is that <clears throat> there's a lot of salt in the ocean, we know that, but there's a lot of other things as well. And so in the 1990s, laboratory studies focused mostly on salt. And you know, I remember my group reading your papers, Barbara, back in the 90s, really motivated a lot of our thinking and our work, and it was very exciting um, and, and very influential to um, my lab. And so um, building on some of that work, um, if you will, we decided to really up the complexity, not just study sodium chloride, but try to really uh, think about the complexity in this way. And so again, you go back to the environment is very complex, um, and you have um, <clears throat> biology. Biology messes everything up, Scott, by the way. <laughs> I won't blame you, he, you know, okay. Anyway, um, you know, you have a lot of uh, the <laughs> organics and every, a lot of biochemical processes. You know, I came in just as a surface scientist trying to understand things, but you know, when you work together you, and you collaborate, and we've been able to do so with this uh, center that I'm part of, the Center for Aerosol Impacts and Chemistry of the Environment. And what we've done is we've, we've replicated the complexity of the ocean, or partially replicated, in this ocean atmosphere facility at SIO. We break waves with a panel, we put a lid on top of the ocean, that linear portion right in the, in, on the top is the ocean, we add instruments. And I just want to point out, I co-direct the center with uh, Kim Prather, who's in the middle of that diagram, I don't want to point her out. Um, another brilliant scientist, uh, you know, and, and who I've been working with for several years, and it's been just uh, great, and 
uh, I've always appreciated everything we've been able to do within this uh, center because we've been able to do these big experiments. This is what uh, these particles look like when they come out of the ocean, a lot of them. We used a lot of different techniques, but I'll tell you basically the bottom line is you have salt, sodium chloride, but you also have this green stuff around it, the organics, if you will. So again, we're, we're not just an inorganic component, but it's inorganic and organic components mixed together, and we really need to think about them in, in that way. And so um, in our last experiment in summer 2019, and thankfully we did that experiment in 2019 because we had a lot of data to analyze uh, while we were all sitting at home in you know, 2020 and not being able to do you know, much lab work. Um, we had a lot of different uh, questions that we wanted to address related to uh, a number of different things. My group was leading the efforts on uh, sea spray aerosol acidity and uh, that was a paper we published in PNAS. Uh, we, we, we collected the dissolved organic matter, and I have chromophoric, because some of it is light uh, absorbing, and we also did some ice nucleation measurements of the particles that we produced. Um, but let me just tell you uh, uh, um, uh, the last part, and I know I only have a couple of minutes now, is we really wanted to understand the chemistry. In particular, we're adding photochemistry in of this molecule HONO, this little tiny molecule HONO that you see in this diagram, because it's really not understood the production of HONO in the marine boundary layer. And we wanted to see if we can understand that based on the work that we were doing. And again, this is not our work, but other people's work. And what they show here, if you can see on the top, HONO formation is occurring like a, being produced during the daytime and HONO itself can undergo photochemistry, so why is it so high in, in the middle of the day? And then you see in this paper on the left, you see that there's nitrate depletion. So there's nitrate depletion, there's HONO formation, it's happening in the middle of the day, so it seems like there's some kind of photochemistry going on. And this other paper suggests that as well. So what did, what did we want to do? We wanted to understand this photochemistry. And so first of all, we know from Barber's work um, that uh, the salt component uh, will react with nitrogen oxides, including nitric acid in the atmosphere, to form sodium nitrate. So we know we get sodium nitrate in these particles. And my, my uh, collaborator, Kim Prather, wrote a paper about that in Science in 1996 when she followed particles from the ocean uh, into California and saw that uh, complete conversion. And others have found that as well. Alex Laskin, you get a lot of nitrate in these. Now we know we have these organics also associated with these particles as well. And so um, uh, Pandit, uh, uh, Shubha and Pandit, uh, uh, Pandit, excuse me, and Stephanie Mora Garcia went on to go look at what happens when you have these organics present and how can you form HONO from these from nitrate solutions? They built a broadband cavity absorption spectrometer to do this study. Um, we collected this organic from this experiment I just told you about, and Dr. Mike Alves led that effort with David Gonzalez and Duan Dang. Uh, these, this, this light absorbing component, you can see it in the middle, uh, is dark, it's light absorbing. Uh, we measured the UV vis absorption spectrum as a bloom. We had created the bloom started. So we're going to use this material and we're going to combine it with nitrate to see if we form HONO. So what we did here is we looked at uh, under the conditions I show you here, basically in a beaker just to see what's going on. It's at acidic pH and Kyle measured pH 2 for some aerosols uh, up to pH 4. And what we see is that uh, when we irradiate these samples of nitrate with these various different organics, uh, MC DOM, that's the stuff we collected, humic acid, we bought that from Sigma Aldridge, 4BBA, we bought that from Sigma Aldridge, or we had no photosensitizer. Um, when we compare that to NO2 concentrations, what we see is that we really are enhancing the chemistry when you have these organics present along with this nitrate photochemistry going on. And so um, the mechanisms are complex, and, and, and Frank is going to push me off the stage in a moment. Um, what I would say is that these organics enhance the formation of HONO through these different mechanisms of secondary reactions with superoxide radical, 
Um, we haven't, uh, we're, and we're trying to prove some of these, whether you have hydroxyl radical produced from the initial uh, uh, excitation of light by that photosensitizer, but even non-light absorbing components play a role in the chemistry as well and enhances the formation of HONO uh, that forms. So these organics are really important in the photochemistry of these uh, aerosols. And so uh, that's what I wanted to tell you um, today. Uh, when you start thinking away from the gas phase and you think about this multi-phase chemistry, really, really complex, and we saw that from Barber's, how do we bring together everything? How do we understand everything? I think we're all still trying to figure it out. It's really important because uh, there's so many impacts associated with this hydrosphere, uh, atmosphere, uh, geosphere, on top of that, a biosphere over all of these and understanding what's going on. You know, we have developed new uh, approaches to studying these things. We heard some development. Everybody here has done some development in their work to understand chemistry. Um, and we have this mesocosm experiments that I told you about. And just the complexity is, is, is daunting. And again, when you want to go predictive, as, as Barbara's report has suggested, how, you know, what is that next step in that predictability? How, you know, you want to generalize in terms of vapor pressure, but then she just told us you can't do that necessarily. And so um, that's what we all need to be thinking about and working out. And then I just want to send, uh, stop by saying um, uh, thank you to all the people that I talked about today. And I show these two pictures. In June 2021, they told us, yay, masks are off, and we took this great picture. And then in August 2021, <laughs> We were back on with our masks, so uh, life has been hard that way. But anyway, I thank you, everyone, for your attention.